Okay, so predicting protein interactions. Uh, for us, protein interactions are physically in contact. So GP100 is a physical contact with the antibody 1. It's a physical contact here with the blue, with the CD4. These are associations. A activates B, so A is in physical contact with B, but A is not in physical contact with D. They are all associated. Uh, the typical high throughput experiment that you do is continues to be uh, used to hybrid for pairwise interactions. The alternative mass spec gives you large compounds, essentially everything that sort of sticks together on a larger scale. Uh, and so these are the ones that really get the pairs. The simplest way of inferring protein interactions is by homology. Now, in the story of typical homology-based inference, we always have the story that a query protein Q, a protein with an experimental annotation, you have a sequence similarity between them that is larger than some threshold. Uh, and if it is larger, then you say you can do homology-based inference. In this particular case, the story gets, of course, obviously slightly more complicated because now you have a pair of proteins, A prime and B prime, and you want to infer from knowing A prime and B prime, those are the Qs here, whether A and B bind. But this means you're not only having one threshold theta, but you essentially have two thresholds. You have the one between A and A prime, and you have the one between B and B prime. Right? Now you can sort of merge them into one by averaging, but averaging is not really relevant. By taking the max, also not quite the right thing. Taking the min is sort of a, is the simplest hack you can do. Ascertaining that at least there's a minimal similarity between the two. So, so if that would be the minimal, the x. So if x were larger than y, then you would know that at least this one is more similar to than this one. Uh, but still, you have a pair inference that you have to make. And the question is. Uh, does it work? Now, there is one simple answer. Obviously, it works because that is essentially the reason why we use model organisms. If we could not infer this at all, there, if you think this through, there would be absolutely no point to have mice do anything that is relevant for human. We must assume that there is some of the biology that is relevant, and it's not only this part. It's also the interaction part, because most of what proteins do is to interact. So if this interaction story wouldn't work, then there would be a lot of problems. But okay, let's just see what comes out. And what I'm showing here is the HSSP distance. Uh, you remember the HSSP curve. So plus 5, plus 10, blah, blah, blah. Plus 70 is a very high. Essentially, this is like 100%. If you have 100 residues aligned, this is like 100% sequence identity. Uh, and those are the levels of similarity. The axis here is slightly removing it, actually uh, misleading. It actually really says 2% uh, precision. So this is by no means a high value, uh, but it is also assuming that everything we know is the complete set of interactions, and that is not true. And that is ultimately the reason why this number is so low. What we do see is, of course, high error bars. It's a, it's a relatively old measurement. So if we were to do that today, 13 years later, I believe the error bars would be lower. What you do expect to see is that it goes down. So the more distant these pairs are, the less you can do the inference. So that is sort of trivial, yeah? What, so the homology inference is what percent of those proteins that have that HSSP score are also protein protein interacting, like pairwise? Yes, exactly. Okay. That's precisely what it is. Uh, it is a is a is a so min. Yes, using the min and using a cumulative, a cumulative, uh, no, not cumulative, cannot be. So it is exactly binning it. I'm sorry. Uh, otherwise, you would not explain that it goes up. Uh, it's, not, it's really binned. Uh, now, what we do, however, sort of suspect is that there is a drop that is going further down because. So this is structure, this is subcellular localization in blue, then there are two enzymatic activity here, uh, one, uh, four digits, one digit in, in orange. And clearly here we are sort of seeing that the signal drops much, much higher. It's not quite true, it's not quite clear where we are, but we're most likely we see some difference here. Most likely we see some function, and if we see some function, we see a drop at levels that are here, where at least for structure, you have absolutely no drop. 
right? So there is a feature, this much becomes clear from this first plot here already, there's a feature that is less conserved than structural localization, so less than anything that is sort of a sing single feature, because it's a pairwise feature, it's more complex. Uh, now, we assume that somehow we can do this because we have corresponding genes in the other organism. This is why we can do homology-based inference. We can do homology-based inference because there is the same protein in different species. It's the idea of homology. You have homology originally defined as different uh, parts of the body that are homologous in a different organism. Homologous does, as you see between whale and human, not always mean they also really do the same function. But on the bone structure, if you look at it in detail, if you looked at this bone here, you clearly would sort of gaze, uh, would, would see the relation of these. Now, in terms of proteins, the way we think about it, say there's species A that has only three proteins, then there's a species split here in B1 and B2, you inherit essentially the same set of copies, and essentially the same set of copies, these proteins here do the same thing, right? Then there's a duplication event, and we get a species C1 that has something in here that may be free to do something new because it has all of these three essential proteins, right? That's the ent entire idea. And that's the idea behind this, uh, these words, orthologs and paralogs, where the orthologs are the ones that are the corresponding in these species that do the same thing, and the paralogs are the ones that are sort of duplicated and do have the freedom by the duplication because the one that does the function is already there to do something else. That's the idea of a paralog. A paralog is a protein that is similar in sequence but does not maintain the function because it sort of is the idea, the, the mechanical idea, it originated from a duplication event where you duplicated something, you have the function of the thing that you duplicated, and you have the freedom to evolve a new function. Okay, now the problem, so this is sort of what we see today in trees of protein families. The problem is that, of course, we, what would happen if we had jumping genes, right? So, this, so I'm, I'm looking at you, my genes jump to you. Does it happen? One exception. Ah, uh, so this is Barbara McClintock, uh, and in '51 she discovered uh, in this article here. And by the way, those are different days. So there's one table in this in this entire paper. paper so there are more pages here. Uh, and that's the original data, but in corn, in maize, she found jumping genes. In fact, if you look at a corn cup, the different colored corn that you see comes from jumping genes. And they jump really in the sense that you, the way you look at me, you can't believe. So you have a field of corn and they jump from one, from, from one corn cup to another, these genes. Okay? In the bacterial world, you have much more of this, much larger. But here I have another extreme example of that. We're not really having a jumping gene, but you, you actually have a, an algae that gobbles up an entire chloroplast. This chloroplast that it gobbles up is in fact also taken in terms of genome material. It does work in that algae here, uh, and it's called kleptoplasty, so it's the ability to steal. Essentially, this is what it does. Uh, it's very, very proficient at, at stealing. Uh, but the chloroplast does its function, and the genes are used. Okay? It takes up the org organ, if you want to call it that way, uh, the subcellular compartment chloroplast, and it takes the gene function Okay, this is a sort of extreme way of, let's call it gene jumping. Now, I'm not entirely sure why there's something wrong with my talk. Uh, today we know much more of that, we call it transposons. Uh, trans T's or trans uh, transposing, uh, transposable elements. And you know that there are a lot in human. How many are there in human? Any idea? 50%. Yeah. It came from you? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's pretty much. Uh, where, where do you get the number from? I don't remember. So they're shooting exactly to the 50 now. So for years they said 47. Now the number really on the, on the, uh, in the later publication really is 50%. So Alu, Lin are examples for this. So essentially the non coding part of our genome is full of these transposable elements that in fact are genes that jumped into us. Part of that is in fact uh, diseases we had, so part of that is some viruses, uh, but a lot of that really is transposable elements. Uh, 
uh, and they, they are relevant for regulation, it is currently assumed. Now, let me make the story even become more complex. Let's assume we have two pairs. So we have this one pair, A prime and B prime, that in fact is within the same organism. And we have another pair, A2 prime and B2 prime, that is from a different organism. What I showed you so far was A2 prime to A. Let's construct this example such that the distance of A2 prime to A and A prime to A is identical. Or at least that the minimal distance of this pair is identical. Okay? Now if we had that, so if we had cases where A prime B prime would be as similar in sequence to A and B as A2 prime and B2 prime. But a, these two primes are from a different organism and the one primes are from the same organism. Which one would be more conserved in evolution in terms of protein interactions? It's difficult, I have a question. I mean, if A2 prime and B2 prime are from a different organism, yes. we assume they're orthodox. Yes, correct. If A prime and B prime are so similar to A and B, I would rather assume they are rather pseudogenes or something that is... No, so we're not talking about pseudogenes. We're talking about things that are really studied. So I, I'm going to show you results, right? Okay. And the results cannot be on pseudogenes. So the results so are... We assume they are under, under selective pressure. We assume that these are paradox. We would call them paradox because actually we observe them in the, in the same organism. So we tend to call them paradox and orthodox. Exactly. You're totally right about this. Uh, and we are just picking the way we choose our samples to plot the next plot. The way we choose it, we choose exactly the set of orthodox and paradox that are for a, a binning part exactly the same similarity. So we are ascertaining that the x is the same. Or we're picking exactly the subset of those for which the x is the same. And then the question is, which one is more similar? So if I inferred from these two, whether that is true, yes or no, or I inferred from these two, whether that is true or not, which would work better? Yeah, it's a tough question, one of the two. Um, <laughs> yes? Well, I would... Oh, it could be the same. Say that one in the same organism, mm. because maybe the environment is simpler, or it's more similar. So that, of course, is uh, going for the Christmas, the odd Christmas solution or something like that, yeah? <laughs> yeah? I would say that maybe if there are already um, A and B in the worm who perform the function, um, that the duplicate of these pair of genes could develop a different function. Thank you very much. This is why I gave my entire, inter I, my entire introduction, I popped you to make, give the, the, the right answer. But unfortunately, of course, the right answer is the answer that everybody gives, which is the wrong answer. Uh, <laughs> but this is totally unexpected. So Verena's answer is exactly what everybody expected. This is that this curve is above that curve, uh, which, okay, we have a high error bar here, but you see, despite the height of the error bars, there's absolutely no doubt the green is not above the blue. Whatever interpretation of error bars, uh, there is no way in which you can interpret this. You can now say this is sort of warm specific, and then you go to Drosophila, and you have the same story. Uh, at least the main part of the story. You do see that these curves look different. Uh, but what is absolutely not possible is to argue blue is below grain. Uh, and we did also look at human at the time for much more we could not so the arrow bars just just went up shot up much more uh, we, we looked at yeast, so we, we, we looked at some other things so we saw it also for some other things uh, but there was a limited number for which we could do it at the time uh, so meaning that Ultimately, there is some issue with this uh, way we call them orthodox and paradox. There is some issue with the common, in some sense, what you say is most likely what I, uh, so here's the question why, and the answer is we do not know. And in some sense, I, my answer is in some sense similar to what you said. It's but a similar environment. Ultimately, the, I show it here for protein interactions. Uh, many people have put this up later and showed something like that for enzymatic activity, for Go numbers. So the same finding has been repeated uh, again and again in the literature uh, for different features. So there, there clearly is a signal. Ultimately, 
what it means is there is some issue in the way we treat model organisms. There's some problem, clearly, of inferring protein interactions from model organisms. We have to be more careful than we have been so far. There's an insertion. And this insertion is the very simple question, if I had the same interface A and B, and I measured it twice, so I have two proteins that interact, and I, my question is, is it the same residues that are involved in this interaction? What's the answer? I measure twice. <clears throat> so this is, sorry, this is not, uh, you were not there, Yannick, but it's not this example here. In this example, we have a similarity between A and B, A prime. Now I take an example where A prime and B prime is actually A and, A, A and B. So I have the same pair of proteins. I just measure it again. Will I have the same residues that intact? How would you how would you look at that? How would you measure it? So I believe I decide to focus more on questions today than on answers. The random subsets. And lo and behold, 10 minus 300. Now what's the problem? Uh, okay. I said that for very large data sets, chi-square is not really right. The statisticians we talked to, however, pointed out something else. Chi-square applies to data sets that are statistically uncorrelated. All proteins are related. Can we prove that they are uncorrelated? No, we cannot. Right? So, if however you put this argument through, you would argue there is no statistics to apply for, for computational biology. And this would make many people very unhappy. Uh, all the alignments are built on the idea that statistically, uh, there is a statistic independence of, of i and j, which is, we know, wrong. And which we, we know is wrong here too. But still, is that really the reason? Ultimately, we do not know. We do not know the answer to the question what went wrong. We only know it's wrong. Uh, and we try to do something slightly different. Uh, we take these three data sets and randomly pick a thousand amino acids or residues. So again, these pots contain the amino acids that are specific to chain chain, internal or protein protein interactions, right? And we take a, pick a thousand of these uh, interface residues, put it into thousands of each of these here, and then we put another one of these thousand. And we apply for the thousand to on a thousand comparison, a Jensen-Shannon entropy information here, and we simply ask which of these three pots is it most similar to? This does not mean we can predict, but it means that on a large set, in this particular case a thousand, if I pick out a thousand, on these thousand really they look so different that I can sort of predict. Okay? If I had a thousand residues from either of those sets, I could predict the origin of that set, if I can distinguish. Now I repeat this experiment uh, on the next slide, unfortunately, I will say a thousand times uh, because we like the number thousand at this point. Uh, but these thousands are completely independent. I could, could have done uh, 42. Uh, but on the next slide, and we have moved from three interfaces to six different types. Green is still internal, it's the same. Red is the protein, protein is the same. Blue is homodimer. Now we bring in two new classes. Yellow here is also internal, but it's a domain-domain interaction. So it's an interaction between two regions inside of a protein that belongs to two, so the residues are in two different domains of the same protein. The light blue here is, uh, we distinguish between homo, homo oligo, obligomer, so this is obligatorily together, and the term comes from Janet Thornton, uh, and the homo oligomer. So essentially these are proteins for which we never see anything other than their homo dimer. So they are always together. Uh, while these are cases that are essentially, again, two proteins that contact each other, uh, these two versions of the same protein, contain protein A binding protein A, is both of these here, but here, in some cases, A also binds B, and here, A always binds A. Okay, that's the difference. Uh, and then we have the hetero-obligomer, so this is protein-protein interactions, and hetero-oligomer essentially is two different chains of the same protein, so two, two different parts of the same protein, but they are obligomer, uh, wait a minute, this is the other way around. This, I, I got a coloring wrong. So this is the generic protein interaction. This is two different regions of this, I should change the color. So this should be really red 
compared to the last slide. So oligomer means we have two different chains of the same protein. I call them oligomer because they cannot escape each other. So there is one protein, right? They cannot run away, so to speak. So they are obligatorily next to each other in, see, uh, in space at least. It's not obligatory that they bind, but they are sort of forced to be together, yes? Are you defining like, why, why is left different from up? Is that like the, the no, these are just pairings. So what do you mean? Yeah. Uh, numbers don't make sense, so is it something like that? The they are not symmetric? No, not at all. Is the, the left? No, but that... Uh, has something to do with like, which binds or... It's a simulation. No, 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 no. So, it's the other way around, Paul. I'm sorry. Uh, so, we do this test here, right? And in this test, you have an order in the way you go through it. So, whether you test that the, the, the first one, the green, is going to this, or you, you test that something is going to the green. This does not need to be the same experiment. So, ultimately, the asymmetry here is telling you something about the error. I've not it. No, so this is essentially the asymmetry comes by the random, randomness of the proce process, right? Because the numbers come from picking a thousand times. So here I pick three, th uh, three times of a thousand times the, the wrong one, here I pick it no. And the difference between zero and three is essentially there's 0.3% uh, mistake, right? So this is out of a thousand, so this is per mil. And so how are we picking though? Are we picking a thousand times from, from Q1? Yes, we're picking a thousand of these each six pots. So we're going to have six pots in this on the next slide, right? Oh, so of this we have a thousand yes. of, of, of that team. Yes, that's what I'm saying. We have two times, we have a lot of thousands here. So we have a subset of a thousand, another subset of a thousand, and we do it a thousand times. We could have taken any other number, so we tried other numbers. It's just we, we, we picked a thousand because uh, yeah, yeah. you cannot pick any other number. Yeah. Number one doesn't work, yeah. or, or number 100 doesn't work. Yeah. So it needed to be a minimal number, but 888, 842, any of these numbers would have worked. But the problem is that if we had said 842, somebody would have said, ah, <laughs> only works on that number. Uh, and since we picked a thousand, somebody said, well, because you have ten fingers. I'd rather get the attack that I have ten fingers than that I cheated. Uh, it's completely random. Uh, but that, that's also why it always adds up to a thousand. So whenever this number is close to a thousand, in this particular case, it's a thousand. So the rows and the columns always have to add up to a thousand. Exactly. Uh, we do a thousand trials. Yeah. And again, the asymmetry is the, the, the level of mistake. It's the error bar, if you want. Is the experiment clear to everybody? No? No? Uh, so once again, you, uh, you have these pots. So you have six different types of interfaces. That much is clear? OK. So and these are all annotated? So yes, they are all annotated. All, PD, all from PDB. All come from PDB. You have some rule that you say if the closest atom is six angstrom or, or less, you call it an interaction. And you have an annotation for these six colors. That much is clear? Yes. I just have a question because in the first row, like in the yeah. internal, why it doesn't not add up per column? Like because that should be a thousand. So it is no, not no, a thousand. No, no, to the left. To the left. To the left. No, no. Yeah. This? The green one. The green one. Yes, this one. This does not add up. This is 990. It's only going Really? Oh. Mm -hmm. No, you need to add up everything. You need to add up the row. No, 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 no. This should should add. This should add to a thousand, and this should add to a thousand. Uh, and the mistakes of doing this are mistakes in our in our process. Uh, I, I, it should add to a thousand. Why can it not? It must add to a thousand. So it's a mis it's somewhere somewhere is a mistake. I, I, in principle, the way the experiment is conducted, it should absolutely add to a thousand in this direction and to a thousand in that direction. So something went wrong. But in all of them. Yeah. Uh, so if it is always 990, then maybe it's not a, ni it's not a thousand. Yeah, probably one is 95. So this one is... Uh, the next one is 95 something. But this is more. So the numbers are... This, this is a different number than this. 
um, so something went wrong is then the answer. Okay. Thank you very much for... Or did you remove some? Removing a yellow is in the public house. No, but... It cannot, so it cannot be, it cannot be a rounding effect because, because you have, a rounding effect cannot be because it's an integer game. Uh, so it must. I understand why you said that. Maybe, maybe, maybe when they are identical. Maybe when they, maybe the yeah, yeah. remove things when, when, maybe there are cases when, they, when they're, so ultimately the decision is made on a Jensen Shannon information. And if the Jensen and Shannon information between two classes are exactly identical, I actually would throw it away. Maybe that's, that's sort of answering this. Well, but that is a complete. Why, how do you come end, with, end up with more? Oh, you got. Uh, Second column. The yellow column is above a thousand. Great. Falling away, I get. Yeah, I, as you can see, I. Oh, yeah. It's 950 plus 65, it's like 1,015. Okay. Uh, so I'm absolutely, absolutely on top of the numbers. I'm sorry. Right, the story. That cannot happen. So this could not. So there's, this is called bug. Uh, and actually, I never realized that. <laughs> I should have, should, should beautify. This is, I'm not sure whether we, I believe we published this. Um, so we published the work clearly. I'm not sure, we're, most likely we published the table. Uh, so what we actually published, we did the sort of same thing on contacts. Uh, so we went more into the direction of what Paul said initially. So we, we looked at pairs really more than, uh, than at these numbers. Uh, but I believe this, this uh, whatever. No, maybe, maybe it's not. Yes? Back to the experiment. So we have a thousand. Yes? Or, or explain it again. So we have these annotations. So you have, uh, in, in this data set, you have, you have 100,000. Where, where do they come from? So PDB. So again, and we. Artificially put them into three buckets. Yes. So not artificially. No, 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 no. So what we do here is. We have, this is an interaction between two different proteins. This is an interaction within a protein. This is an interaction between two domains in the same protein. Those are three big. And we keep going. So here we have a homodimer, antibody two, one and two. Uh, this is why this is blue, at least this is consistent here. Uh, so this gives us the six pots. Let's just simplify it and say we have three pots. Okay? But this gives us six pots. Oh, but, the, uh, but there wouldn't be the colors within each pot? The amino acids. Well, essentially it's the set of amino acids in those interactions, in this experiment. In another experiment we have actually contact pairs in there. But in, on this simplest level here, we have amino acids. Yes, some of the colors you see some blue in each, right? But, but the, this color isn't what it was on the previous graphic where it was. No, the these, I'm sorry. Uh, colors are now used for something totally different. Uh, oh, really oh, I never anticipated that point. Really so these essentially are the idea, so these are really 20 amino acids. Okay. And I actually simulated them such that they really differ. You cannot really see it now, but I, I remember <laughs> I spent a long time on this slide. Uh, so visually, you, you, it is also so this could be the internal ones or whatever, uh, because this is the fullest. So one is the factor of ten more than the other. Uh, this is not quite right. But the, the, the ultimately, the idea here is you have different amino acid compositions, right? And this is ultimately getting back to this point. You have different compositions of amino acids that lead to our genine has a different composition than expected at random. So all three are different from from zero. Uh, and they're all different from each other. Now I'm asking, is that really a big difference? And for the big difference I'm asking, if I took out of all of these internal being uh, several million, out of these oh, several million internal, let's say this is protein-protein interactions uh, for which I have 100,000 protein residues, I take the 100,000 residues and put them into this pot. Now I pick up 1,000 of these. Or let's, let's just play it different. 666. Mm -hmm. And I pick up another 666. So I do that for each. So I pick up 666 here, pick up 666 from here, pick up 666 from here. Mm -hmm. And now I pick up another 666. So now I have the same number of amino acids or residues in each of these. But I have different colors, I have different compositions of them. I have different amino acids or may have different amino acids, right? If they are all the same amino acids, then they don't differ. But if I can, by some Janssen-Shannon entropy information, so by some similarity of the entire data set in terms of their composition, 
percentage of amino acids, is what you essentially ask here. If you can distinguish and you say this is the most similar one, then it finds its original data set. If you say this is the most similar one, it doesn't, or this one, right? Now I repeat this a thousand times. Okay? So I pick once, I pick another time, I pick a thousand times. And ask for a thousand times which pot is more similar. You see how, how often it finds itself. Then you see how often it finds itself. Now I do that on six, and you see the diagonal here, and that's the most extreme case here. Uh, it always finds itself. Then, then maybe the more is ties. Sorry, the maybe maybe it had the tie oh, score yeah. in the yellow. Yes, yeah, what I meant. Well, maybe that's why we have more than a thousand. Yeah, yeah. With, with uh, no, but uh, wait a minute. Same exact score for two buckets. No, but if you it twice. No, no. But either or, right? Either you either you throw it away and then you have fewer, or you call it in both and then you have more. But you cannot have you cannot have both. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we understand the experiment now. No, you cannot. So the monolithomer <laughs> is very strongly conserved. Yes. Well, actually, ultimately, what you see here, uh, all the, so the, the, these six types differ on at least on a set of a thousand, because it was not six hundred sixty-six, but it was a thousand, and on that large data set, they differ. The other thing that you see is if you sort of the largest. Confusions are between domain domain and internal. And somehow this is biologically also very similar. Whether you have an interaction internally or between a domain and domain. And ultimately you get back to the assignment problem. So maybe you called it domain, two different domains, and you, maybe you were not quite right. So that would be a confusion in here. Now this case here, the heterooligomer. So these are two different parts of the same protein, two different chains in the PDB. You have a chain break, you have a break of the protein, it's still one protein, and this is really similar to domain domain. Because there's two different parts of a protein, whether it's a domain or it's there's an actual break of the of the polypeptide chain. Uh, so again, this confusion you also understand. Uh, but you do see that sort of the generic protein interactions does stand out enough so that you this is the same thing on the level of contacts, uh, and I don't want to go into that, but you stand out so much that you believe you can do machine learning on it. In the machine learning, you oops, uh, I'm gonna have a window, so this is is the one hot encoding here. I'm going to have a window of 13 consecutive amino acids. I'm going to run it through some artificial neural network and with two output units, P, protein-protein binding, not protein-protein binding. There are uh, essentially two possible situations. So it could be that this unit has 0 0.9, this one 0 0.1, and you would say it binds, or at 0 0.6 and 0 0.4. Also you would say it binds, but this is weak and this is strong. And now I'm going to show you, then you can include uh, other information like secondary structure, solvent accessibility, disorder, the big elephant here, evolutionary information, and all kinds of other things. Uh, essentially we, we used at this point everything that we had predicted already, put this all in and uh, got a prediction that in this particular case, well, this is only using sequence. Uh, this is recall precision. You see essentially you can predict some, but very, very, very few. This is sort of uh, half, it's 5% roughly what we are talking about here, of the ones that you could find, you find. Uh, this is just blow up. The same thing is still sort of for 4%. Here you see more clearly where it ends. Uh, this is clearly still just sequence hot, one hot encoding is better than random. Uh, and when we look at a particular example here, where we sort of look at the most ex extreme prediction, in some of these cases we read in every single protein predict one that is right. So in that sense, even from sequence alone it works. Uh, then we filter uh, and we put evolutionary information in and then we get this signal. So now this is the original one, sequence only, that essentially is evolutionary information, predicted secondary structure, and all kinds of other things. Now that's random. What you may stumble over or observe is there are some cases here where you have a very high precision. Very few. 
is, is, is uh, ballpark one to two percent. But there's a high precision. And that brings up the question, could these be hotspots? Hotspots, the idea of hotspots uh, ultimately is when you have this interaction that typically say is stabilized by 10 pairs So 10 pairs, uh, then typically they do not contribute equally to the energy of binding. What it means is that the delta delta G of binding, this is not one tenth of it. But typically there are some binding or some places here, like this one and this one, that may together have 70% of the delta delta G. So there are two single of the ten that contribute most to the binding. And this is what people refer to as hotspots. Now if you plot this in, so, in terms of the, the ten, the contribution of the ten, each of these ten, one, two, three, four, five, ten, to, to the energy of binding, then it, ultimately what you have for every single protein interaction that I've seen measured, you have some exponential decay. In this exponential decay, now you may say, okay, by some threshold, so I define some sort of average number here, and I have some top number, and I say if this, the, the difference between these two is a factor of five, there's a five-fold increase or something like that, I call this to be really outstanding. And then I call it hotspot. Another way of arguing, so agnostic people, I call them the hotspot agnostics, they would argue, well, this is an exponential decay, but there's nothing different between these here and these here. It's just a continuously def uh, decaying function. It's exponential, but it's nothing, there's nothing specific about residue one, it's just more, right? Now, we observed these curves and we wondered, could these be hotspots? So how would you check? Well, you would sort of find some data set for hotspots in red. Uh, again, for the, uh, the protein pair that I showed before, simply because it was done in the neighboring lab. Uh, red is observed, purple is predicted. So now we have a prediction from a machine learning device that was never trained on hotspots. It never was trained on the delta, delta G of binding. We, we, the method never saw that. All it saw is a residue that binds by Yannick. Next, next uh, lesson in 9th of January. 9th of January? Okay. Happy New Year. Happy, happy New Year, Thursday. happy holidays. Hmm? Happy New Thursday. Correct. Uh, so, as you can see, so this is sort of plot on the 3D structure that we did not use, is from sequence alone. Back to what Verena said. Uh, again, we are not doing the pairing at this point, we're just saying that it binds. Uh, but you see, even on the structure, that is remarkably good. Sometimes we over predict here, uh, sometimes we under predict. This one here we miss. Uh, but it is remarkable and then you know we would use a larger data set and it looked kept looking remarkable uh, and we're going to go over that now if you have a method that predicts binding sites you can use this to and i, I click over this one too uh, the idea is you can possibly use it to go from the micro level of binding sites predicted to the macro level of protein hubs so hubs are proteins that interact with many other proteins. And the idea here is very simple. If I predict many binding sites, then my protein should have many binding partners. Can you think about an example how you can sort of immediately contradict that assumption? Can you think about something that immediately would contradict this? In principle, this makes sense, right? But is there something that comes to your mind that would immediately be an exception? So a protein with more binding site is more likely to bind to more proteins. That's essentially what this model assumes. What would be a problem for that kind of model? Or what would be a dent in that image? Yeah? I mean, it's not what we were talking about earlier with those kind of like enzyme binding sites and normal binding sites. So if you have like these huge areas that are binding, yeah. or you have an enzymatic like that is true. So, like a metal ion binding site in there. No, but we are talking protein protein here. 
When I talk about a hub, I mean two proteins that bind, or uh, one protein. So the hub is the slides that I skipped over. Essentially, talked about the uh, the. Di I'm really getting closer to Christmas and running out of every everything I have. So when you plot. Uh, number of binding partners and the number of cases, then you see some zip kind of law. So some proteins have, many proteins have a few interaction partners and some proteins have 60 and more. There's a long tail here. Uh, so, okay, yes, you know, some binding sites are longer. So protein-protein interfaces may involve 20 residues, they involve, may involve 80. But if you observe 180, you know it must be more than one. Right? This is clear. If the largest one is, is 80, at least two of the very largest one fit in there, right? Uh, whatever is your model of, of a sort of average binding site size, it's more than one. 800, 180 predicted in your protein, right? Uh, so there some, is some correlation. What is the, the problem of that model? So that is not the problem. It is a problem because you don't quite know. So you, you cannot quite read it off the number and say this number. But you can say that the one on the extreme end will have more than the one on this end. Well, if you have like a huge binding site, you also need a huge binding site on the other side, which is why yes. you don't have that many binding interaction partners. Yes, the, but the, inf the funny thing is that, in fact, this is true, that there's very few proteins that have a lot of interactions. Right, so, but, so but there are a few... means less partners because there are a few proteins that have such large sites. Yes, but they have a lot of interaction partners. This is exactly what we're looking for. We're trying to go from the micro level, from, from the molecular level, to the level of interacting proteins, which I don't see on the molecular level, right? I have no idea about interacting proteins. All I see is the number of interacting residues. But can I possibly predict that? But the problem is a different one. So this, yeah, this is a problem of, of sort of normalizing it. I cannot say number, but I could distinguish between the ones that have clearly more and clearly less, right? So in the extreme ends, I can take it apart. So the variety in size is going to be a problem for giving a number. But it's not going to be a problem for getting at the two extreme ends. But there is something that is the problem for the extreme ends too. What is that? Oh. <laughs> no, I misunderstood. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I. So, no, just to clarify now, so what this graph shows is uh, basically that we have proteins with like bigger or more binding size and they also have more binding partners. That's the assumption. That's the assumption. That's but nice. then we assume something like that. So I, I put a line in there because I ultimately want to say this is sort of the underlying assumption. Whether it's a line or not, let, let's not get into that. But ultimately, on the extreme ends, it's a line. On the extreme ends, I say if I have a lot, so if I'm very much up here, I should be having more likely more interaction partners than down here. That's all that this model at the end of the day. Maybe I should cut the line into two points. Uh, that may be the right way. But ultimately, this is the idea, right? Yeah? But are there, like, I don't know how we call them, these proteins which are in different compartments and uh, or highlight proteins, or how do you call them? Ah, uh, moonlight. Moonlight. Um, Moonlight proteins have two different functions. Why do, why, why do they worry here? Why do we <laughs> worry about those? Well, actually, you're getting in the right direction. Uh, and you anyway, saw the next slide. Oh, sorry, yeah? Yeah, and, and I think, like I said, we have those hubs, right? Where it's just, it's one thing that a lot of, like, a carrier so protein, the, like a carrier protein. Exactly, so the, uh, this is the, the, the terminology from Mark Vidal from Harvard. So Mark introduced this distinction between a date hub and a party hub. Again, hub is a protein that has many binding partners. Date hub means there is a one particular binding site that binds to many other proteins. This is like in a date. You speak to a person you want to talk to and you speed dating so you, this, the same face looks at different people. Right? In a party, you sort of, your face goes like this and then you sort of you interact with people in a party not only through your face. You hear, you, you, you touch, I don't know what, but there's a lot of, lot of parts of your attention that sort of goes around and that's the idea of a party hub. So in a party, you contact people in ways that are not focused with one binding site, but party hub is the idea you have many different binding sites 
and you bind many different partners. Okay, a party hub is essentially uh, this 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 protein here binding like that to three different ones, and the date hub is this 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 at different times. Okay, and that of course the date hub is the killer of my story, because if I if I have many binding partners with the same binding site, that is something where I would see a lot of binding partners completely independent of the predicted binding sites. One hotspot, or one, one, one binding site, right? Uh, so let's just look at the large data set. And what I see is that when I look at my number, here's the number higher, more predicted, you see that date hubs and no hubs, they essentially look similar. Uh, in the non-3D way, you don't even see the difference. So the gray and uh, the date and non-hub is essentially the same line here. While the party hub, so the ones that have many binding sites, they in fact are different. So we can distinguish them. Now, you may, some of you may remember the story of disorder. Uh, when we look at what are disordered regions, and there's a particular sort of so-called loopy type of disorder, uh, you see the story is inverse. So in the loopy type of disorder, date hubs stand out. So now I have two methods. I have one that is sort of disorder related, that allows me to pick up date hubs. Another one that is sort of predicting particular residues that bind, that allows me to pick up party hubs. And that sort of uh, lets us go from the micro level to the macro level and Yanai has a few years ago published a paper in which he has the prediction method and an experimental verification of that.